Do you know what that song is? I'm gonna say you don't. Hi. What's up? Hey. How are you? Good. Good. Good to see Hi. you all. Yeah. Well, thank you. We've never done this before. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Yeah, it's uh, Friday afternoon, so good. Very nice, very nice. So we wait a few seconds. I'm Robert, owner of New York City Slab. They call me Black Lumberjack. And I started this conversation with Black Lumberjack because there were people who do cool stuff who I want to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what's cooler than building a ship? <laughs> so yeah. I decided to reach out. And thankful you all were receptive. And here we are. So nice. tell us about you all, where you are, what you're doing, and then we get into the question. Okay. There we go. How are you? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are currently in Costa Rica, in Punta Arenas, which is a very small kind of village, very small point on the uh, west coast of the country, and we are in the process of building a ship. It's going to be a uh, three-masted square rig cocktail schooner. There you go. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, sort of a mouthful. And yeah, we are a couple of years into the project now, and yeah, making really good ground progress. Uh, so on. So I'm, I'm going to ask you all a couple of questions, and I, I ask all the guests these. Do you have an overused phrase or word? An overused phrase? Uh, probably squeaky no, but this is uh, referring oh, yeah. to Where the cat. Is she? Who is, uh, Where'd she go? Squeaky no! Yeah, she's, she's run off. We have uh, three cats here at the yard in... Um, yeah, they're often up to no good. And uh, anything else? Yeah, we often tell stories. <laughs> oh, very nice. What's what's the cat's name? Squeaky. <laughs> Luigi. Squeaky. 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 <laughs> Squeaky. Yeah, That's cool. Now, how how long have you all had the cat? She's about a year, one year old. Oh, okay. So is she a rescue, or you have always had her? No, the, the neighbors found her in a ditch. So, yeah. Well, good for you. Good job. What is your least favorite thing to do? My least favorite thing to do? Um, I don't know. We work with a whole bunch of different woods out here, and uh, some of them are tough than others, and some of them are just so incredibly hard and dense and heavy, and they're filled with silicates that like blunt your tools. So working with the uh, Tamarindo del Monte, which is what the keel is made out of, it's just, it blunts everything within seconds in like a job that would take you an hour, takes you two hours. It's just such hard wood to work with. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that's my least favorite bit, but it's a challenge. It's, it's a real challenge. All right. What is your most favorite thing to do? Oh, my most what is favorite, favorite thing? <laughs> um, it's a family well, show. I, <laughs> I usually work on the, on the framing stage. So, um, my favorite thing is just seeing the frames go up and we've got a really good team and we work really fast and really now, No, th this is in life, not just for the show, just in oh, life. Uh, What's your favorite thing? I mean, I'm a pretty hardcore woodworker. I, I enjoy just making things. At the moment, I'm making handles out of wood. We broke like three sledgehammers the other day, knocking in the, <laughs> knocking in the uh, bolts for the stern assembly, and uh, I find it quite relaxing to make handles. So yeah, I, I like. He can't. He can't not talk about the boat. 
What what do you make the sledgehammers out of? What kind of wood? Um, at the moment, we're making them out of uh, wafinol, which is also known as, I think, Brazilian cherry or Brazilian rosewood. Sorry. Uh, and it's a really hard wood. It's not ideal because it's really hard. So uh, you kind of feel the vibration. Oh, we have a selection. Yeah, this is... This is whapping old right here. It's like a real beautiful, dense, heavy red wood, like tight interlocking grain. So is 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 you said it's it's, it's called Brazilian rosewood? Uh, yes, that's like Orjatoba. It's got like a whole bunch of names. We call it whapping old, which is what the locals call it here. Okay. Uh, Take the name. Yeah. Take the name. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, so this is the name followed by the, the local name and the Latin name of that word. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, the next question is. What is the one thing you would change about your spouse or significant other? That's not me, so he can say what he wants. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave that one. <laughs> say that again? My answer to that question is absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Good. What, what makes you tick? Uh, I don't know. Uh, just good energy. Just doing. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. Hot but tracks. Hot tracks. Hot tracks making sense. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. What hurts you the most? Sorry. What hurts you the most? What hurts me the most? Hmm. Um. I don't know, when things could be done a lot better and someone just doesn't care and like you can see that and then I don't know, that gets to me. I don't like that. Uh, yeah, same yeah. here. <laughs> yes, apathy. I'm with you. What sound makes you happiest? Um... It depends. When I'm working, the sound of chainsaws is pretty good, but after work, it's pretty bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I like it. <laughs> what sound bothers you the most? Uh, yeah, after work, when, or really early in the morning on the weekend when someone decides at 6.30 it's good time to fire up the chainsaw two meters from my house. <laughs> that, that's the noise. <laughs> What's your favorite curse word? Fuck. <laughs> uh, what profession other than your own would you try? What's that? What profession what? other than your own would you try? Uh, I don't know. I'd like to be like a, a rally car driver. That seems pretty fun. <laughs> All right. All right, cool. Um, the last question. What would you want on your tombstone? On my tombstone? <laughs> um... I haven't really thought that far ahead, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> lived a good life. That's an answer. That's good. All right, so what we like to know is your journey. After high school, the mm -hmm. things you've done, and how you got to this point, and what made you want to build a ship, and why? Oh, yeah. Um, well, after after high school, I went to university and I studied geography. And 
when I started at university, I realised that it wasn't really what I wanted to be doing, but I'd already started, so I thought I'd finish it. So I got my degree, and then after that, I moved back home. To... Now, where's home? Yeah, I'm from Cornwall in uh, southwest England, and uh, I'm from a little town called Penzance, where there's not a lot going on, but there's a lot of fishing, a lot of boats, and a lot of harbors so I uh, just didn't really know what to do with myself and then um, when I was younger my dad used to like to make slingshots so I decided to make a slingshot and I went out into the woods and like cut a little branch and I quite liked it and then I made another one and I made another one and then ended up making like 20 and then my mom was like oh you clearly enjoy working with wood so why don't you do something with it so I uh, had a look at courses, carpentry courses, and saw like furniture making or boat building, and I thought boats sound pretty cool. It um, does. And yeah, my granddad was a carpenter, and so was my great granddad. And uh, my dad's also pretty practical. So when I started the course, my granddad gave me all of his old tools, some of them were my great granddad's tools with his name stamped on them. So I spent like a summer restoring those and then uh, did a boat building course in Falmouth, also in Cornwall. And then after that, I worked in several yards in, in England. I did work building, restoring houses, and ended up working in. London for a little bit, restoring Golden Hind, which is a replica of Francis Drake's warship, Huge Galleon. And then through a friend who was working out here, who I worked with at another job, I found out about this project and got in touch. And then, yeah, I've been here like nine, ten months now, and, and I love it. It's a great project, and a great place to be. Okay, so how, how many boats have you built before this one? Uh, I mean, I've built quite a few smaller ones uh, before this. In college. I don't know, I've worked on so many, but like the actual completion of a boat, I usually move on, especially for a bigger one. I've worked in a company called Ruffler where I built, I think, about four or five fiberglass yachts, but that was more of a, a fact where we were building the same boats over and over again. And um, then, yeah, other jobs have just been restoration on. But yeah, I've worked on 20 plus boats. And how did, how did they find you for this boat? And what was your reason for wanting to do this? Um, well, I reached out for uh, this particular job, but my job prior to this was restoring a huge wooden galleon. So I was doing a lot of traditional shipwright, shipwriting, boat building, um, working with a lot of old timbers using, or large timbers using a lot of old methods and something that not a lot of people have very much experience in and yeah I started doing it and I loved it and then I kind of got a little bit tired of restoring old boats working with rotten wood all the time and like they're just in so much worse condition than you initially think they are so you're just like chasing rot down and it's hard work pulling out old nails so I was just extremely of working on something new and yeah, this up came up, so I had to take it. Okay, so so where where are you from again, and where are you? Uh, I'm from Cornwall in southwest England, and right now we are in Punta Arenas in Costa Rica. Okay. Wow. So, away from home. <laughs> right. So how big is this boat going to be? Uh, it's going to be, I think, about 45 meters. Uh, 
well over 100 feet. I forget the conversion exactly, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a sizable ship, as you can see from the pictures. Yeah, it's, it's quite sizable. So what's the purpose of building a boat? The purpose of building a boat? Well, I mean, uh, it depends what you want the boat for. This one is for sailing cars. Right, that's what I mean. Yeah, uh, like this is, we want to be a carbon neutral project. So we, uh, uh, for this, you just want to use wind power to sustainably transport cargo across the globe. And we'll also have electric engines, which will be charged by the wind. And it's just to in the shipping industry, which is responsible for a hell of a lot of pollution. Um, it doesn't cost anything. and It looks after the planet. So for this, it's the sustainable source here in Costa Rica. So what, what kind of... What kind of woods? How many different species? I think you had a sample gun. How many different species of woods are you using on the boat? And where do you get them from? Well, we are using maybe around 10 different species of wood for the ship at the moment. Um, different areas of the ship require different woods with different properties. Um, all of the wood we have sourced for the for the hull is from Costa Rica and most of it is very locally sourced. At the moment we are in the rainy season it, that creates a lot of landslides so we have so much wood that just came down in the landslide which is so good to use that and make the most of it. Um, we have a lot of different sources but it's all very local stuff really um we do have wood for the masts which is being outsourced that's from uh Haida Gwaii, which is a uh island uh a canadian island I'm not exactly sure where it is no what kind of what kind of wood is it you have from another island um it's sitka spruce a kind of pine that grows really long really straight really strong uh softwood and it's perfect for masts and spars so we outsource that because we just can't get timber of that quality here it doesn't grow um but this is very sustainably sourced wood we have like videos of how we got it and, and how long is that piece Ooh, i actually don't know but it's very big uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but it will be uh, shorter than the boat, but maybe like, um, ooh, my mind's on blank right now, but around something like that. Okay. So you get the wood in, I see that you're doing some chainsaw milling with some yeah. of it, with other stuff. Is it? being milled locally at a lumber mill? Yeah, I mean, we do almost all the milling ourselves. Uh, very recently, we've got some stuff that was uh, milled for us, but that's milled by uh, a local team, by uh, a man who sources our wood. His boys, his family business, milled up the wood for us. But uh, that's just because we had a lot of other stuff where we needed all our guys working, so we couldn't have them like spending time milling. But generally, all the milling ourselves, we've got the wood miner, uh, like a mill, and the Alaskan mill with with the chainsaws. So, who does someone go out and fell the trees, or? Or do you already have a source where the logs are already down and you get it? Um, we have gone out to fell the trees before, but usually uh, Ednan is our source and he goes and fells the trees 
for us and uh, everything is environmentally sourced. Uh, we got a whole bunch of wood recently because they were widening a road for quite a long stretch that they had all these beautiful big by the side of the road that were all just cut down and would have just been waste wood, fence posts or whatever. So he, I, everywhere he knows where all of this stuff is going down and yeah, our thoughts is where we get, we did some wood ourselves, but that was earlier on in the project. Now, like, we can focus on the boat, so it's better to outsource that labor. How many, how big is your crew? Uh, around 30. It changes, uh, but around 30. Is anyone... Did anyone come from your country with you, or did you pick up local people once you got there? Oh, no, we have a whole bunch of locals working with us. We have maybe 10 Picos, 10 Costa Ricans working with us. Um, but we have a very international crew. We have people from Madagascar, Belgium, Australia, England, France, just all over the place. It's a, it's a real... And how did how, you get these... These people, were they already here or did they also no. let you apply? They're just like me. They just saw the project and wanted to be part of it and applied. So, uh, yeah, it kind of attracts a certain kind of person, this project. It, it, uh, we have a lot of them. So that's good. And how long do you think this will take? Um... Another couple of years. It's a it's a big project, and it's hard to put a uh, definitive time frame. Some things are quicker than you think. Some things are a hell of a lot longer. And with building ships, it's such a complicated thing to build. So there, there's always going to be bumps and hurdles. But yeah, I think that we are aiming to be watered by the end of 2025. So that would be uh, and What wood do you find it most difficult to work with there? Uh, there are two. That would be Tamarindo and Wapinol. They are uh, I'm trying to think. They are like similar hardnesses to Purple Heart. I don't know if you know Purple Heart. Um, yeah. But it's it's harder. It's tougher. Uh, it They just blunt your tools. They're, the grain is very interlocked. It's not straight. And, um, yeah, but often uh, typical edge tools don't work so well. You end up having to grind it. But, you know, there's ways around everything to get used to it. But then when we go back to Cedro, Cedro Margo, which is like Spanish, and that, that's beautiful wood to work with. I think it, in comparison, it's so soft. So after you spent a week working with you know, when you go back to Cedar, it's a beautiful thing. So, uh, yeah, lots of different wood to work with. What's the longest tree you all have had delivered? The largest tree we had delivered? Um, or felled? Or felled. Um, probably the wood for the keel, which is like the, the very center line of the ship, like the kind of backbone construction. And that's actually made of three separate pieces of wood. And I'm not sure of the exact size as just done before I got here, but they're big, substantial pieces of wood. All right, and you and you all break it down with the chainsaws, and then you put it on the wood miser. Uh, yeah. Well, with the tamarindo, because it's so hard and so it's built with silicates, like really fine sand particles so it's just impossible to cut on the wood miser you would just go through the back door blades in minutes um 
So we we use the elastic because the chains or chains are easier to sharpen. So we use the big steel seven tools on the elastic. If you have a whole bunch of chains, that are sharpness. So we have a whole bunch of sharpened chains ready. But like you would a couple of feet and cut before it just stops cutting. Uh, so we have to stop, change the chain, fill up, up um, and on going. And there's so much input that's out of there, so it would be easily up as you're going through the cut, so then you have to change the wood down and like with wet trying to clamp it down so it wouldn't throw the uh, throw the saw. Can we get a tour? Uh, is that possible? Uh, I don't think it is actually because right now we are currently in the office, which is the only place with Wi-Fi. I mean, I can kind of give you a tour of the office. I, I, I wondered about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I'm... So how? Oh, how often on? are you using hand tools on the ship? All the time. Um, I mean, the majority of the wood is done with big power tools, but the final fit is pretty much always done by hand. Um, there's a lot of times when just a hand tool is right tool job and is in fact quicker, especially when doing like a lot of the joinery and things. Just like it's, it's cut with a big beam saw, but finished with a few strokes of the hand plane. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of hand tool woodworking that goes on. Okay, on a ship, on a structure that this big, how close are you to measurement? How precise are you aiming to be? We are like, we have a five millimeter uh, allowable tolerance when we're building the frames. And um, so the frames are cut with five millimeters extra on the outside. Um, but they are made from uh, the lofting pool where the entire ship has been drawn full size in uh, three different sizes or three. And um, yeah, take it off the lofting pool and we use something called a, a horning stick where you go on the center line swings upwards and we mark on the stick all the measurements that we need. So then like frame it takes to kind of place the point so it's a perfect image. And you have a like five allowable tolerance but you don't need a few the millimeter because on something well on something this scale two millimeters out find it's no big difference. The wood is often quite with timbers being large, this large, uh, like shrinking and movement of wood to be expected. But this is why we have the five millimeter tolerance because after the ship is built and all the frames are ready, they've been sitting there some for over a year. So they not as much as they but done most of the removing the circle until chip is in a smooth, even curve. It's done by pressing high spots and then playing those high spots off, usually with power play, then often the desired fit. And we've started set already in the forward chip on the inside the outside and the outside is kind of not easier to play because timber you're working up really really hard work but the curves are easier to do with normal on the outside but when the curves are on the inside it's a pretty complex process um and lots of old to use like uh, adds it traditional chip rights tool kind of like add axe but instead of the plane 
be in vertical, it's kind of horizontal, and sometimes have scoops in, but chipping out the on inside curves. And, uh, yeah. Very nice. What's what's the single largest timber on the boat, and what's the average? What is the average size timbers of the boat? Uh, the single largest timbers would be the masts, um, but and they are around ten meters tall. I don't actually know how tall they are, but um, at the moment we just raised the stern assembly, which is about two and a half meters tall. But um, this is we're building but it will be higher construction on the aft end of the ship. So end up triangle approximately two and a half high and then that will be stretched six inches forward. And all of this build is what called deadwoods, just a solid piece of timber, which are is why stacked on each other. So it's gonna be a wall like a wall of solid timber. Like uh which is about uh twenty five centimeters. Um is long by I think so it's just going to be huge uh, the, the scale of this thing is so so impressive um, but the side of the, the, the frame is, uh, each frame is each uh, frame individual we have double thorn frames so that um, around 14 feet so about 6 or 7 Per side, the double sawn frame. So, like uh, two feet with like that, but with, with the butt overlapping, um, and each side mirror. Uh, so the wood would be around two pieces of both. By um, what's the plan? What's the how do they plan to move this big ship once it's ready? Um, that is still to be confirmed, but there are like systems with rollers that we can kind of, like get it out through the back of the ship. It's built on a How slope, and there's a big gap in like just going straight into the water. So uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Still to be confirmed, but people can move much, much larger ships than these, so uh, it's going to split out into the water. Right. How far, how far are you from the water? Not far. Uh, I'd say about 10 meters or less, um, but also we're in quite a, a tidal area where the, the tides go up and down quite significantly, but we are like, very close to the water. So. Shouldn't be in it. What do you? How many hours is an average work day? Uh, average work day starts at six thirty in the morning, and we work until four. But we have a one-hour break for lunch and um, a another breakfast break as well for half an hour. So. Um, but a lot of people work overtime just if, if they want to. But, uh, yeah, it's it's tough work, uh, especially we're coming into the rain now, uh, so everything's lush and green outside. But in dry season, when it's just so so hot, then you have these massive timbers outside. Like you have to drink so much water and take breaks, work in the shade. Is it's it's a harsh environment to work in. But, uh, yeah. What is weekend life like? Um, at the moment, I mean, we're all stuck here in the yard. A lot of people live here. But um, there's, there's a lot to do. If you like making things, you're in the perfect place. Uh, I mean, we, a lot of people did go on... Uh, just like little holidays, little trips around the country. But we have a couple of small boats, so we go out in the boats. We've 
got the beach nearby. Uh, yeah, just have a cook. It's, uh, it's quite chilled out. So, yeah, weekend life is, is nice. Everyone's, everyone looks forward to the break. Yeah, same here. Um, so if anyone has any questions, Um, I think I saw some. I'm going to have to scroll up a little bit. Um, it says, is this a single plank or a double plank? What are you using for coffee? Okay, so um, it's going to be... Oh. It's going to be uh, just a single plank uh, construction, but it's going to have ceiling planks, which are the internal planks, and the hull planking. Um, so we're going to have one layer of planking on the inside and the outside. And um, I think we'll be caulking it with cotton. I'm not entirely sure. But, um, yeah, lots, a lot of caulking. Uh, talking by hand which is uh, so what is your frame uh, stop sorry uh, the next question is what is your frame stock and is it a bent frame or all solid um well our frame stock is usually made of uh spanish cedar which is uh it's the double sawn frames uh and they're made out of a lot of individual pieces. Um, each piece is uh, six inches, uh, 15 centimeters sided measure, but that's doubled. So it ends up being 12 inches or 30 centimeters sided measure. And uh, they are around four meters tall in like a, a big U shape. Um, so they weigh around the sun, um, they're big pieces of, of construction, and uh, yeah, that's our framing. So the, the big timbers, everything is being done by hand, right, in pulleys? Um, yeah, we just raise them with uh, block and tackle, like traditional, what you, you'd use on a sailing ship, and uh, we just do it with the strength of our crew alone. Um, the frames used to be moved with a Lewis winch, which is kind of winch that uh, is attached to a chainsaw, and that would pull the frame across. But generally, it's actually quicker, uh, although it's a lot more work to just push it by hand with massive bars, like really big digging bars or levers. Um, so we get like four or five guys pushing the frame to where it wants to be, and then... Um, we have a big system where there's ropes attached to the top ends of the frame and there's a block stopping it. So the frame uh, is kind of rigged up at the top and then well, it would be rigged here and stopped here. And then just by the strength of our team, it gets pulled up and uh, there's someone in the middle overseeing and seeing whether it needs to be pulled more one side to the other. And we're trying to slowly, smoothly, and evenly. And so far, everyone, every frame rating has been successful. No, no accidents. But we have like maybe ten people or more on each side. So it's like twenty, like the strength of twenty people having to pull and raise up these things. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, but we don't have that many. Uh, Big bit here. We have one tractor, uh, but that's it. And almost everything is done by hand. Wow. How many chainsaws do you have? How many chainsaws do we have? Uh, we have a special chainsaw workshop, and they all, I'd, I'd say around 10. Around 10. And we have uh, a lot of guys who are passionate about chainsaws here who like take it apart, clean them properly, tune everything to get them running well. Um, 
Yeah, chainsaws are probably the most commonly used tool here. And what what would be the most commonly used hand tool? Um, it depends on what people are using. But, uh, a lot of power planes, um, because after the wood has been milled, it needs to be flattened on each side. So there's like a lot of people flattening by hand. Um, and yeah, prob probably planes. And, and uh, all of our uh, stock for the frames is all cut on our chip saw, which is a kind of bandsaw. It's an antique bandsaw. It's over 100 years old, I think. And uh, on a usual bandsaw, the bed bandsaw can, can rotate. But so it's an amazing bandsaw. Yeah. Um, but on our one, because the timbers we are using is so big and heavy, uh, the bed stays stays straight but the actual the whole machine the whole like band or assembly can tilt either way so we have um we don't have any three-phase power here so we have a old motorcycle that's been welded to the back of the ship sort of and um yeah we have to fire up the the motorcycle to get the thing running it's really loud uh so everyone's got their ears i love to see a picture of that but at some point. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that is what we use to cut our rolling bevels because the angle changes on the on the ship. Uh, as, as you go up and as the ship's going further up, we've got to keep this angle moving and consistent and it's got to flow in to all of the other pieces. So uh, that, gets, that gets used a lot. Um, yeah. All right, cool. So we are 242. Is there anything that I missed or you'd like to share with us that people don't know about building a boat? Um, there is a lot about building a boat. Um, and you'd have to do like a hell of a lot of homework to find out all of it. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a lot of people just don't understand the the scale of uh, what we're building. It's just enormous. Um, it's, it's very, very yeah. It looks hard. it looks enormous. Yeah, um, on a ship, there's rarely any right angles. Everything is curved this way. It's curved the other way. So when you're fitting things and making things, it's like far more complex, time-consuming process. So, I think he just left. Um, so we'll see if he comes back in. There we go. Gotcha. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. It says, um, the question is, whose design is the boat? Um, I think, I know that it's a design from the uh, Oland Islands, which are um, just off the coast of Finland in, in Europe. Um, I think it might be Gustav Eriksson, but I'm not... I'm not 100% sure of the design, but it's uh, from a boat from the 1920s uh, called Ingrid. It's what we based our design. Um, our architect has made some tweaks to make it a little bit more modern, but generally the, the build is going to be very similar. What exact role do you play in it? Are you building a certain part, or are you making sure that everything is getting done? Um, a little bit of both. I don't know. Uh, generally, I'm on the framing stage, so it's my job to make sure that all the frames are built in a timely manner, uh, to make sure that they 
I oversee the frame raising, make sure everything's going well um, and just everything's running as it should. Um, but yeah, my, my role is just a being a shipwright. So if I don't have one specific job, if I need I need somewhere else, I can uh, leave the guys. On the they are now a pretty well trained team, so I can. They know what they have to do. I can just leave them to it and come check on them every now and again. But uh, it's doing. Our next question is, do you have to bin your plank? And if so, how do you do that? Um, we will be steam bending the, the planks, the majority of them. Um, we haven't fully decided what we're doing with the garbage plank, which is the very first plank or straight uh, upwards from the keel, the very bottom of the ship, because this is going to be five inches thick, also Spanish cedar. And there are some places where we can steam it, um, but other places where there's compound uh, where it, it's too much to ask of a five inch timber to actually carving it out so a little bit of carving um, and yeah that's that's the plan all right cool I think so have you ever done any cover planking which is a very old European system of putting a plank together without caulking um no, uh, I've done some clinker planking on a Viking replica boat that I worked on where the planks are over each other. And um, we just had a bedding compound, kind of fire and cement, and that was uh, kind of forcing to keep it watertight. But this is the parble plank, uh, which is where planks left on it in between the butt joints we have a, a bevel, a little apple, uh, talking bevel which allows the cotton uh, or oakum to be forced in between the gaps in the plant to make it watertight and then uh, have a compound over the top to seal everything. Uh, what plank fastenings will be used? Um, Generally, I think we're going to use uh, big spikes or nails, but also we have, uh, we're planning on using a lot of trunnels or tree nails, um, which are essentially just dowels, thick, uh, long dowels, which are then wedged either end. And uh, we are planning on doing both the ceiling and the hull planking at the same time. So we want to force them down into position where we want them clamp them in place and then drill through each plank at once and then drive the uh, dowel through there and then wedge either end and then cut that flush and then it's a really secure method of planking and also we can make the trunnels ourselves so it's uh, also pretty economical. All right, cool. Well, check. thank you very much for your time. No problem. Um, we really appreciate it. What you're doing is absolutely amazing. And thank, and thank you for sharing it. Right. No problem. Thanks for having us. All right. It so said, what do you use to Purple Heart for the blocks and chalk? Um, no, we don't actually use any Purple Heart, but we are using the Guadinol for the blocks and chalk, which uh, has a really tight interlock strain, quite resistant to splitting, so it's good good material for that really heavy really. so yeah it's the right choice all right thank you thank you yes again thank you very much we really appreciate it man and good no luck problem. to you cheers bye cheers stay safe Ciao. thank you